Most Americans have heard the tall mythical tales of George Washington, how he wore wooden teeth and chopped down a cherry tree before famously admitting to his father, I cannot tell a lie. But more recently, some of you may have read James Thomas Flexner's or Ron Chernow's scholarly biographies about our nation's first president. Good evening, I'm Jim Falk, president of the World Affairs Council of Dallas-Fort Worth. And this evening, Alexis Coe will join us. She's the author of the new book, You Never Forgot Your First, a biography of George Washington. And in this book, she brings a fresh perspective, one that combines myth-crushing research with great style and humor. But before I turn the program over to my good friend, Jeff Engel, let me just remind you about a few things. Tonight is a program co-sponsored by the World Affairs Council, especially for members of our Global Forum, and of course, SMU Center for Presidential History. And I wanna give a few shout outs. First to the Billingsley Company for being sponsors, patron sponsors of our Global Forum program. And then this evening, I'd also like to introduce one of our interns. Uh, his name is Farhan Bwanji. He's a senior at Plano West. And uh, like many of our interns, he helps make me look smart. Tonight, he's gonna make Jeff Engel look even smarter by preparing, he prepared a briefing book. And it's a wonderful opportunity for us to have them in our office. And we're able to do it even in this strange virtual environment. We have students from Columbia and Georgetown University, AU, and of course, SMU. Let me also remind you that you can purchase a copy of You Never Forgot Your First by your local independent bookstore here in Dallas, Fort Worth, that's in Terabang. And you can get a 10% discount uh, by just typing in the code DFW World, not just for You Never Forgot Your First, but you could also probably get Jeff Engel's book. And uh, you know, it's gonna be mighty cold in Dallas this in the next few days. Understand uh, it's gonna be even maybe four degrees on Monday, about 11 degrees on Sunday. And if you've not yet read When the World Seemed New, uh, the wonderful book he wrote a few years ago about George H.W. Bush. It's on my, well, it's not on my must read book because I've read it, but it's a book that I would read over and over again. And then something, unfortunately, continuing to be timely, Jeff, along with John Meacham and Peter Baker, uh, they wrote a book called Impeachment that came out about two years ago, a wonderful historical analysis of impeachment in our nation's history. So you might wanna pick up that as well. If you've not uh, subscribed to our YouTube channel, I hope you'll do that, share it with your friends, and that's it, DFW World. Uh, professor Engel is the founding director of the Center for Presidential History at SMU and a professor in the Clements Department of History. I've plugged his books enough, so I'm not gonna say anything else except to turn it over to Jeff. Jim, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I have to say, when you combine the idea that it's going to be very, very cold with talking about my books, it, I would like to also recommend that it can be used as kindling uh, if need be. Uh, I'm not in favor of book burning unless I get the royalties, I guess is how, how it basically works out. So thank you, Jim, for that introduction. Thank you for setting up this uh, evening, which I'm really excited about. Thank you to everybody at the World Affairs Council. Thank you for Han for that wonderful briefing book that Jim mentioned. It's really, uh, really nicely done. Uh, so I am really excited about tonight's conversation. And when Jim first came to me and said, would you like to lead another discussion about George Washington? I sort of focused on the word another. Uh, how many discussions of George Washington do we possibly need in life? And then he told me which one it was going to be and who the author was. And I got intrigued and I read the book and said, yes, this one's really, really good. Uh, I actually can't recall when I've read a biography that I've enjoyed more. Uh, and I think mostly because of the, the wonderful fresh tone that Alexis Coe brought to this book. And of course, I'm going to ask you some questions about that because George Washington is not a man who we should consider to be understudied. Uh, George Washington is not a man who, frankly, many in the academy would suggest is on the cutting edge of scholarship. I mean, I, I hate to break it to everybody, but he's kind of one of those old dead white men that uh, are not necessarily popular uh, in the academy today. But Alexis has done an incredible job of bringing him to, to life anew. And I'm really so very excited to, to have this conversation uh, with her and with you as well. So please, if you would, again, look down to the bottom of your screen, you'll see the Q&A box, enter your questions, and we will get to as many of them as we can. And I know I sure have a whole bunch. So without further ado, uh, let me introduce uh, the author of this great book, which I really recommend you pick up a copy of, uh, Alexis Co. Alexis, welcome to Virtual Dallas. Thank you, thank you for having me and thank you for that wonderful introduction. 
Well, I'm really excited about this. So um, just to get everybody on the same page, uh, tell us about the, the genesis of this book and how you came to this topic. I mean, George Washington's important, but why was he important to you? I am a political historian, or at least that's my origin. I've become a presidential historian over the last decade or so. And um, I was at the time that I, this book came to me, I had published a book in 2014. This was about 2015, a full year later. And um, I was hosting a podcast for Audible called Presidents Are People Too. And looking within that literature for what I wanted to do was a micro history. That was my first book. And a micro history is not the sweeping biography. They are um, sort of inventive approaches that do tell you the entire life of a person, but through sort of a side door, whether it's about women or slavery or some sort of other issue. And the way that I would prepare for every episode, which focused on one president, was to read, you know, four or five biographies. And the logic behind that was I would emerge understanding where the study of that president was. Authors don't usually agree on everything. They often refer to each other in, you know, at some point in the book, either in the front or the back, in, you know, conversation, in, in reviews, you get a sense of, of what's going on. And also every sort of angle on the president. That never happened with George Washington. I read five books and then I kept going and I felt as if they sort of all proceeded in the same way from the beginning to the end. They covered the same topics. Some of them were 400 pages, some of them were a thousand pages, but their perspectives were incredibly similar to me. And Again, I just, I felt so far away from him. And so I needed to write another George Washington book. And the title of the book was actually the subject line to my agent, because I knew this was going to be a tough sell. And the body of the email said, um, you know, you can't say he was the general. You can't say he was the president. Um, what can, you know, no wooden teeth, no cherry tree. What can you tell me? And he responded, I'm listening. And he's not an easy sell. He's not an easy sell. Well, I'm glad you made the sell because it's it's <laughs> really interesting and a really interesting take. And, and you point out in your, forgive me if it's the preface or the introduction, you, you point out that you are unusual among Washington biographers, um, frankly, for your gender. Uh, could you talk more about that? Because I, I was so pleased that you embraced that question in the book. Uh, and I'd love to hear you say more about what that meant to you to write a woman, uh, to write a book about a man as a woman who was writing and competing with, frankly, basically only other men uh, mm -hmm. for the subject matter. I knew that it was male dominated. I had been to the symposiums. I researched at Mount Vernon. Um, the thing that I didn't realize until a couple of years into writing was that when I say male dominated, I mean 100%. I didn't know that. I, I like to, as you know, when you write a book, you have to mix things up. And so I moved my desk and I rearranged all my Washington books. And instead of sort of, you know, by, um, I was sort of, you know, it was sort of haphazard. I decided to group biographies together, books about, you know, farming together, the government, you know, the revolution. And I noticed that all, almost all the books were by men, but every single biography was about a man. And I thought, I, I thought, oh, okay, that's just, you know, I obviously don't own, own every biography. I've returned those books. I, you know, I, I'm just missing out. This is my fault. I couldn't, I couldn't find anything that, that would back that up. And so I emailed Mary B. Thompson at uh, Mount Vernon and I said, is it possible that I'm the third woman to write a biography on Washington in the last hundred years? And it's been 40 years since a journalist and a novelist wrote biographies of Washington. But the only woman historian period, a practicing historian, someone who is, you know, has a graduate degree, and she had to look to it. It's not something that anyone really thought about because you just sort of took it at, at face value. And then a lot of things made sense. 
the the perspectives, um, the lack of interest in certain subjects, the um, everything sort of clicked. And then I was faced with this challenge. Do I just say it? Because if I say that, it is going to um, excite probably half the people who hear it and really piss off the other half. Um, but it felt intellectually dishonest not to talk about it and to also talk about where we could go with this and what has been happening in the field and that this is not an unfamiliar story. Annette Gordon-Reed, for example, when she intervened in Jefferson's studies, of course, they were altered completely. Um, not to say I'm anywhere close to that, but there is, um, there is, there is a, a path that has been laid and it's just, it's taken a really long time for us to get on it. So it, it's a, it's a really interesting journey that you describe going from your uh, understanding that there is your realization that there is this gap in the literature or this conformity in the literature, if you will. And I can see why your agent would be excited because if half the people like the idea and half the people hate the idea, that means everybody's talking about the idea. But tell us more about what you actually found that you think is different that you brought to your analysis in the project by being a woman. And, and if you don't mind, I'm going to focus on thighs uh, because you focus on thighs. And I do. Everybody understand that I'm not a weirdo by saying that. <laughs> How dare you ask me about thighs? I, um, that's another thing I did not intend to be in the book that ended up in the book. In we we as historians have um, labels that we apply to certain types of history. We usually call this kind of history great man history, um, in which is more celebratory than an examination of the life. Um, I noticed that the Washington scholars tended to um, write about him almost like they were writing romance novels. Mm -hmm. They talked about his thighs in a very graphic way, but they, it was a general conversation about his body, which is amazing, but not for what it, you know, not, not for 20 pages on just the aesthetics of it. Um, particularly if you look at the portraits, you know. So I, I came up with this idea that I started calling them the thigh men of dad history. And I had that in brackets for a really long time. And when I say they, I mean, um, Ron Chernow uh, is sort of the biggest offender. And then we have um, other people like, like Joseph Ellis and, and Richard Brookheiser. Um, and, and then a, another thing that people really wanted, my second reader is my editor really responded to it. And I think there was, I think one of the, um, either the New York Times or another, another paper said, you know, the, the term makes me cringe, but it's really effective. And that's exactly how I feel. And I have to hear it all the time. Um, but the thing that the thigh men did is they tended to go with, again, this, this sort of collective, this consensus history, as we call it. Um, and so the way the story goes, Washington was, he lost his father when he was a boy and, you know, this was, he was a dominant figure. So then he sort of shifts his, uh, paternal affections to his half brother. And he's just trying to escape his mother the whole time. And, and someone like Turner will, will really paint the scene, you know, that, that Mary Washington, his mother, you know, busts into his house and she, she, she starts, you know, yelling or, um, he'll, he'll just sort of invent these things. And the, the sort of, you can't really fact check a thousand page biography, but there were moments in which I just knew something was wrong. I smelled it. And, and that I think does happen just, just having different perspectives. You know, you could say that being a Californian versus someone from the East coast all also lent a different sort of lens to this. But Chernow in particular would describe Mary Washington in these ways that I found, I would find really odd for anyone. So, so the sort of the romanticizing of Washington and his body and, you know, the way his, his thighs grip the flanks of a horse, the opposite would happen with Mary Washington, which they would come down really hard on this single mother. Um, but she's, ne but they're never, they never really paint it that way. To me, Washington is in a group of, of really interesting presidents like Ford, like, um, like even for, I guess, you know, uh, 
Obama and you have Clinton, you have a lot of different presidents. And, and that's a great American story, but even I think arguably more interesting because Washington is the grandson of an indentured servant. So they weren't really interested in that story. But the way I figured out that I need to check everything about Mary Washington was Chernow described her as crusty. And that was really odd to me, the, the same way that the, the talk about his thighs were. It's not something I would ever use professionally to describe anyone, male, female. Um, and then he started saying, you know, he just went on and on. I mean, I list 26 words and those were not all the words that he applied to her that were pretty aggressive and insulting, but one stuck with me, which was illiterate. And the reason I thought it was odd was I had already dipped into the archives a little bit because even as I was preparing for this, you know, audible podcast, I'm a historian and a lot of these things are digitized. So I like to check them out in real time. It makes it exciting. Otherwise you're sort of, you know, it's just a book. Um, so I checked, I had seen, I thought that there were Bibles um, that were annotated by Mary Washington. And I was pretty sure that I had seen letters going back and forth. So then she's not illiterate and illiterate is something that it can also be really class-based. Um, and so I looked and confirmed that she did in, indeed write letters. They weren't beautiful. She had, you know, basically no education. She didn't read novels like Martha Washington or other well-to-do women in early America, but she was certainly literate and very warm, which is another thing that she is often accused of not being. There's a heartbreaking letter in which she misses George Washington when he comes through during the revolution. She hasn't seen him in like seven years. She's lost a few children, a son-in-law, um, and Benedict Arnold had occupied Richmond. It was a scary time for her. And she writes this heartbreaking letter in which she talks about how much she loves him and misses him. And it was just heartbreaking for her to miss it. So it just seemed like every time I checked on anything to do with women or slavery, they hadn't told the full story and they certainly hadn't told it the way I would. You know, it's, it's interesting because I think one way to approach uh, understanding another person as you're writing your own biography is to read everything that you can about that person. But it didn't occur to me till you pointed out that the, the adjectives can sometimes sink in uh, and maybe permeate our thinking. I mean, did you ever talk to, just as an example, did you ever talk to Charno about uh, his use of particular language that was you know, creating a, a mental image for, to be sure? It's interesting. Um... I think you're right that it does become this echo chamber. And um, when you look at some of this, the when you try to look for these sources, we look at citations. And a lot of time in particular, in particular with Chernow, he cites himself. So you're kind of going through like four or five, which is a big no-no. You're not supposed to do that. You're taught that, I don't know, day one in grad school, you don't cite yourself. And you try not to cite secondary sources as much as you can. Um, so I did, I talk about him just in the, in the, in, in the introduction, I think. And um, I talk about the realization of, of so few women in, in the preface. But when the book came out, I was very fortunate. It got a lot of attention um, three weeks before COVID. So I also got like that coveted, you know, mini, I, just a small chance at a, at a book in 2020, which is truly a miracle. Um, and everyone was focusing on it. Everyone was talking about it. Everyone was asking me about either the thigh men or Chernow, the thigh men or Chernow. And I started to think he he was going to think that I was trying to bait him into a fight, that I was trying to sort of, um, you know, capitalize on his success or leverage on it irresponsibly. And that was not what was happening. I disagreed with some of the things that he, a lot of the things that he wrote in Washington, but liked a lot of other things that he did. And I even say in the book, I like his, I like his writing, which a lot of people have said, how dare you? I don't like him. Um, so I wrote him an email and I said as much and I, you know, thanked him for the attention he brought to Hamilton and he didn't, re he didn't respond, but I understand that he got it. And it was like understood that, that this was just being made into a big deal. So I have, um, respect for him and what he's done. I just don't agree with a lot of the things that he says. Um, let me just clarify one thing. Uh, you know, on day two is when we teach graduate students not to cite themselves. On day one is when we teach them to cite whoever is teaching the course, 
That's yes, of course. That's the important thing. Um, let me ask you another question, if I may, about, I can't believe I'm going to use this sentence. Let me ask you another question about Washington's body. Um, yes. Because I, I've written on him, and to be fair, I'm pretty sure I didn't, I've never done a full-scale biography, but I've also never talked about his thighs. But I did talk about Amazing. his height. Yes. And the, the magnitude of his physical bearing. How do you view that? And it, it, in essence, and let me ask this question a different way. Do you view it differently than other biographers, you think, because you're bringing this new perspective uh, that focusing on a different way of understanding his, his body, his height, the way he used it as a part of his charisma and magnitude? A little bit. I mean, I think... Um that it's really important to remember that, yes, he was a little bit taller. Jefferson, though, I think was just an inch shorter, right? So he was he was quite tall. But another thing that, that the Thymen sort of struggled to describe is um, charisma and also how his body moved, you know, throughout space. And I realized at one point that they were bending over backwards. They just needed to say that he was graceful. And for some reason, they just they just can't say that. But Washington was an athlete. He seemed to be really good at um, anything physical that he tried on. And he also, he had been sick from such a young age. He had survived so many diseases that he just sort of went really hard into everything. So the combination of being um, coordinated, you know, I, I sort of imagine it's like watching a football player run across the field. Um, that combined with this natural charisma, he also didn't talk a lot, but he was really comfortable with that, which makes, of course, everyone else really uncomfortable. So he had this sort of power in a conversation. Um, but again, you know, his body is amazing, not for what it looked like, but for what it survived. Um, you know, smallpox, if he had not contracted smallpox when he was 19, and then um, understood that it granted him immunity and and then insisted on inoculating the continental army the first year we were fighting a war there was you know at that point in our minds no way we were going to win it's incredible so i i think his body is not only really interesting to talk about in um what it meant at the time but also in sort of a larger sense for our country and for the revolution um couple things. Let me encourage everyone to continue to uh, offer their thoughts in the Q&A. Um, there's some great questions there already. Also, several people have mentioned that my microphone is low. I checked my settings. I don't know why. So I'll lean in. So, you know, I'm not leering. I'm leaning. Um, in that vein, uh, talk to me more about Washington's, frankly, his ego. Uh, this is a, a question that Steve Watson offers. Um, I mean, every leader has ego. Uh, did you find Washington's to be particularly useful or particularly larger than others around him? What role does it play? I think Washington was incredibly confident. Um, his ego, so it's complicated. It's, it's, you would think particularly that power is a huge part of the draw from someone, you know, for someone like this. When I think about Washington, I think that he wanted to prove himself. I, I say that he wanted to be at the center of his country's story and that country changed. He really tried to be, you know, the biggest colonist when he was a teenager and he just could not get a fair shake from the British. Then he gave that up. His retirement plan was Martha Washington. Um, and I think that all of this sort of helped him be satisfied at various stages of his life. And that is why he wasn't power hungry. So it's, if we had had someone with an ego, Napoleon, for example, I think that we would have possibly a very different country. And Napoleon on his deathbed was complaining that, um, you know, he couldn't be George Washington. Everyone wanted him to be. He made everyone look bad because he, he would accomplish something and then he would say, I'm good. And he would really want to retire. Um, and then some new opportunity would, would, would come before him and either he wanted it or he would be sort of forced into it by the other founders. Um, but I think that is what allowed him not to let his ego get away from him. But he could be stubborn and he had such a bad temper that he worked to control. It's so interesting. I, I reviewed a book on Benedict Arnold a couple of years ago in the post and I talked in the introduction about how similar Benedict Arnold and George Washington were until a certain point. And one of the major factors is that, you know, 
Arnold had a huge ego and he also um, was never satisfied and constantly had a chip on his shoulder where Washington had that as a young man and he learned to control it. He realized it wasn't helping him. Um, and so I think that's an essential part of, of his being is this interesting question. How is he different when it comes to ego and power? It's a good question. Well, and, and if I could dig down into that, because it's one of the questions I've always wondered about Washington, that you, you mentioned that he has this remarkable ability, at least as we understand him through history, to be satisfied to give pack power either as commander in chief or, or excuse me as commander in chief of the army and then as commander in chief as president uh, as the two best examples yet he also clearly was ambitious uh and determined uh and uh, i've often been confused and wondered how much of his protestations of i do not wish to serve are for history. Uh, yes. How much was he simply saying, please don't throw me in the briar patch, if you will. So uh, what's your reading of this? Absolutely. Well, it's so interesting because I think he was satisfied and then the goalposts would be moved mm -hmm. and then he would sort of rise to the occasion. Um, I think that we have to remember that, that Washington was, I call him a reluctant revolutionary because, and, and I would say the same with Jefferson and a lot of other people who, you know, if we just look at the Virginians, they had plantations, they had money, either, you know, cash, land, or in people. They, I don't think would have rebelled if they had been given a fair shake, which is what they felt like they were denied. So Washington really tries everything before he's going to, um, you know, he doesn't approve of the Boston Tea Party. He, he thinks that, you know, that's a destruction of, of property. He basically is really resisting until the very end. Now, when he shows up in Philadelphia and they are, you know, the, we are about to go to war, he stuffs himself in his old militia uniform he has no experience leading a large army, let alone a large army against an army that is being led by two brothers who are decorated, who have a navy, we, we barely have rowboats, you know, everything is, but he, if this is going to happen, he's into it, he's going to do it, and, and but he doesn't, he doesn't say anything, he lets, uh, you know, the, the couple people who, who stick their necks out look like they're power hungry, he just, he just, stands there but he does sort of politic for it after hours um he goes to all the pubs in every house you know he loves to socialize but he's not quite that social he, he likes a smaller set he likes everyone to be approved and he he um so in that instance I think he very much wanted to be general and he went off and he was ready to rise to the challenge it's sort of like you're you know you don't want to take a job that you feel totally qualified for. You want to grow in the role. I think that was his perspective. He literally picked up books on how to do war. So he was, you know, he was really trying. Now, when he gave up power after the Treaty of Paris, after the revolution was won, I 100% think he wanted nothing to do with it again. It had been eight years. Mount Vernon had fallen into disrepair. Martha was really tired of being on the road. She hated to be out of Virginia. Um, and she joined him every winter. She was getting, you know, impatient with that arrangement. Um, and he, he kept writing to Congress saying, tell me how to resign. I really want to do it however you want to do it, but I want to do it by Christmas. I really want to be home for Christmas. Um, and I think when he went home after the revolution, he planned on staying there. And it only became his unretirement because the articles of confederation where they were just they were a mess and he really hated them and you know he was getting all these sort of like missives from john jay from all these founders who were saying we're gonna blow everything that you worked for everything that you suffered for this amazing win and then you gave up power to this international celebrity and he still says no but i will go to the constitutional convention and that's where I still think he didn't want power, but he wanted like sort of one last hurrah. So he goes and of course is immediately elected president and he just sits on this platform. After he again makes a quick exit, he signs and he leaves. 
and he thinks he's he he really does think he's done and then Hamilton's like no you showed up that was basically you saying you're going to be president and he calls the presidency and and he doesn't say yes right away. Madison has to like skip out on his own family's Christmas to go spend it with the Washingtons to give the final push because the letters aren't working. Um, and when he finally agrees, he calls it the, 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 the journey to his inauguration that he's basically going to his execution. He has everything to lose. He did not want that role. And then he wanted to give it up after one term and they made him do it again. So it, he, he understood that like, you cut out while you're ahead, you know, you quit while you're ahead, you quit while everyone loves you. Um, and that just kept changing for him until, of course, he was not as beloved. Well, and, and that's, uh, I, I'm curious, because I always had the impression that, my own take at least, is that he went to the Continental, excuse me, the Constitutional Convention, that as Hamilton suggested, his decision to go was really a decision to go back into public service for good. Uh, but as you point out, you know, that, that can change as well. Uh, you know, his, the, the Washington of, of November may not necessarily be the Washington of December, may not be the Washington of March. Uh, so um, let me turn back to some more of the great questions that we're getting here. Um, uh, Kristen Kullenberg uh, wants to know more about Martha uh, and her place in George's legacy, especially as she puts it from your unique perspective as one of his only female biographers. Martha, if Mary Washington is painted into the devil, Martha Washington is an angel. Mary is crude and illiterate. Martha is, um, you know, posh. She, again, reads novels. Um, that is the Martha that you're showing. I wrote a piece this month for Smithsonian. And the Martha that you are showing is the Martha that we think about. You know, she's got the bonnet and um, she's quite a bit older. That was not the Martha that Washington met. He met a woman in her late 20s who was a widow with two young children, which in early America was the best deal you could possibly find. Um, paternity wasn't quite as, you know, a biological connection wasn't quite as important. Paternity couldn't be proven. Um, she was the only heir besides her children. And so she had this unprecedented power and she was quite beautiful. This is another thing. Chernow goes on and on about Martha and the Martha who we saw. And then he ends after three pages, he says, but she was considered a beauty of her day. Okay, so we didn't need the three pages before that. And that is what I mean. We kind of get lost in this. And so with Martha, we have to remember that she was young, she was good looking, she was um, a good mother, and she had a lot of power and agency that she gave up. Not easily. There were a lot, she was the, I mean, she was like the, the most eligible woman in all of Virginia, if not all of America. Word travels pretty quickly considering. Um, she, had turned down many suitors. Washington, on the flip side, had always wanted to marry rich. It was the plan. He was pretty interested in anyone who had a dowry um, and who had like some, you know, in in society. He never dreamed he could do this well. So Martha, they're like this young couple with everything going for them. They have, they go to balls, they go, they go to the Capitol all the time, they party, they're, um, you know, they're raising young children. And um, she likes, as I mentioned, to be home. She is a homebody. She's uh, not happy when, when they have to go to war and she's not happy. She's really not happy in New York. Um, which was the site of the first president's house. She's a little bit happier in Philadelphia because it's closer to home and they had had a pretty good time there during the revolution. There were interesting people there, Elizabeth Willing Powell, um, who actually a, a librarian at um, Sarah at Mount Vernon is working on a book about her. No book has been written about this woman who ran all the salons in Philadelphia. Martha writes a very revealing letter. She's also terrified of inoculations, but she has it. 
um, she has the smallpox inocul inoculation. And Washington makes fun of her a lot in letters for her fears of inoculation. He he writes to tutors of her of their son and says, you know, don't tell her that this is happening because she'll just freak out. And you know, she he does a lot of that sort of withholding lovingly. Um, but when I say stepchildren, you know, he very much took he loved them as if they were his own to a frustrating degree for him. Um, when Martha is the Lady Washington, as she was called, we didn't call them first ladies for a long time. Um, and I don't know if any first lady has ever liked that. I think um, uh, Jackie Kennedy said that the first lady sounded like a cheap racehorse. <laughs> so Martha Washington is the first lady and Washington like nobody knows what a president is supposed to do they left half of it up to him that's the whole reason they wanted him to be president and he figures he needs to go on some tours so he's off doing what Washington does best which is looking at very boring machinery and loving it riding his horse all over the country and she's got to host these salons and all these things and it's just not her way with all these northerners and she likes to be around family and she she writes this really touching and sad letter to her niece who is like a daughter Fanny, and she says this role like it's meant for a younger woman who would enjoy it more this is just not for me and Imagine living a life that was not for you for eight years of a presidency and eight years of a revolution and all the years between them. It's a lot to ask for someone. That being said, we need to look at people on their best days and their worst days. We need, and I like to sort of tell those sorts of stories. Um, before we talk about Martha could be pretty mean. Martha, um, you know, Washington in his will emancipated one person outright the day that he died. That means without any conditions. Um, and uh, William Lee, who was his right-hand man during the um, enslaved right-hand man during the revolution and was crippled in his service. And the rest of the people that he owned, so who were not a part of Martha's first husband's estate were to be emancipated either upon her death or at her will meaning that, you know, she just want, she, she was going to grant them early. I'm pretty sure he thought there was absolutely no way that that was going to happen because she wrote such things as, you know, the word that you use during that time, Negroes are very bad in their, they're basically, they're innately bad. She, um, you know, own a judge who Erica Armstrong Dunbar has made, you know, a name we all know, which is wonderful instead of, you know, an, a, a footnote in Washington biographies. Ona, M Martha felt like she treated like a daughter. She enslaved her. Um, and then she was going to give her away as a present, a wedding present to a person who is known as the most volatile in their family. And she could not comprehend why Ona would leave and you know how, how they were convinced that a, Fr a Frenchman was always to blame in early America. They were convinced a Frenchman had lured her away for a really long time. And Washington pursued J Ona Judge so vigorously in part because Martha was, was pushing him to. So she's a complicated figure who, we have no good biographies on, I'm afraid to say, um, or not not complete. They're all sort of these polite um, biographies that don't treat Martha or any of the other first ladies, this tends to happen like their own people, like they're, they're fully formed people with thoughts of their own and other interests. They're just sort of looking at the man. So any worth that Martha has in a biography is getting to Washington to the point where she marries him. And then everything is about anything to do with him. So she's not really living her own life. So the thing that I thought was interesting about the Smithsonian, they asked me to write about this dress and they didn't really tell me what to write about. And I realized it was during this sp specific time, this time between the revolution and the presidency and that it had this pattern. So I, I, I talked to another historian who specializes in material culture, which is, you know, the, the stuff of life that still survives. And she pointed out that it had, um, I knew it had bugs, but it had all sorts of bugs. And it also had, it had flora and fauna that was 
um, particular to America. And then she pointed out that um, one of the few books that Martha kept for herself from her first husband's library, they were about flowers and other natural, um, you know, of the natural world. And then I remembered at Mount Vernon, um, she was so known for sewing these shell pillows that they they sell like a patchwork um, kit in the Mount Vernon store. So Martha Washington as a naturalist like blew my mind because it was the first original thing I'd read about her ever. Mm. So I think there's if we can get someone to do it, there's there's a better Martha Washington biography, and then we would all know a little bit more about her. That's that's really interesting. Um, you know, it's it's hard. It, 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 you get really at the heart, I think, of trying to uncover under stole, under told stories uh, in the past that we have to we only know about some of these figures because of their relationship with central power. We only know about uh, you know, own a judge because of her relationship with George Washington. Yet she, of course, is a person of her own. Uh, and how do we separate those two? Is a really complicated question you know I'm, I'm actually going to combine a couple questions that have come in that are really good um in particular uh one from camille davis and one from david taggart uh camille is actually one of our best graduate students here so um i really should just have let her do the interview to be honest because she knows a lot more about this than i do um but she asked the question uh, what was washington washington's sense of antiqui antiquity um and how much did that play a role in his decision to leave and to give up power knowing that that was a traditional story within the stories of, of the Greeks and Romans of when the virtuous citizen gives up power and I want to combine that with something that that David Taggart asked about which was frankly Washington's intellect uh, mm. you know we do not think of Washington as on the same intellectual plane as Jefferson um, yeah yeah he yeah, yeah he led Tell us more about how he used those those two aspects of his life, his understanding of history and and his own intellect. Those are, I mean, those are good questions. It's really interesting to combine them. Um, my mind is like racing because if you go to to the Fred W. Smith Presidential Library at Mount Vernon, you will see that they have busts um, of of the presidents and of Franklin and um, founders. But but you know, in Washington's own study, when he when he came into some money some Martha money, the first thing that he did was order a bunch of busts. Um, and of course, Caesar was among them. And he was very interested, as they all, all the founders were in antiquity. Um, I think that he, he certainly understood that one could usurp power, seize it for themselves in a, in a moment of uh, flux, shall we say, not bloody flux, which was another thing that he suffered from quite often. This is the problem with with not being in person. You make a bad joke. You can't you can't tell if everyone's laughing. But I, I see laugh. I see I Jeff laugh. is I see Jeff is chuckling. Your audience laughs. Um, so so I do I do think that it had something to do with him. Maybe something sunk in. But I really do think that um, much like I don't like when when people say that someone was destined to be president because you're denying them their very interesting path in which they worked hard and they made these you know compromises that were quite compromising and and other things that make the story so much more interesting. Um, I'm not sure that we can say that that those influences were too explicit, but I do think that there is something really interesting there. And I think what we that then speaks to is that I don't want to say that he was, you know, self taught, but Washington had to leave school when he was quite young because part of being raised by a single mom from the second marriage is that everything goes to the first marriage. Washington's father was buried next to his first wife. Imagine being Mary Washington standing there, understanding that, you know, his two sons from his first marriage were going to get basically everything. Um, so he had to drop out pretty early, and he felt very self-conscious about this because he ran in this crowd with Adams, went to Harvard, um, you know, Jefferson, you know, he he went to to marry. William and Mary. William and Mary. Yeah. Um, Jeff Jefferson. I was thinking about Washington and Lee because um, one of one of 
uh, Trump's attorneys went to Washington and Lee, which is so interesting because they added Lee after and Lee was, of course, a relation. But anyway, so <laughs> he went with all these, the, you know, he ran with this crowd and he was really self-conscious of um, being like a rube. And if you look at what they say before the um, before he was president, all the founders say, you know, he's he's just amazing and he's he's so interesting. And then after one of the sort of worst digs is that John Adams um, says that he was, you know, too, too uneducated, too illiterate for his post, which was like, the thing washing, you know, if, if you walk, if you're able to hear the thing that you fear everyone thinks about you, that's Washington's biggest fear. Someone like John Adams would say, oh, he really wasn't, you know, he was just trying to catch up. But one of the reasons I didn't focus on the battles that much in, in my section on the revolution is one, it's been done. Two, he wasn't at every battle and he wasn't at some of the best battles. So it's sort of whenever people talk about those battles, you know, they start with like Lexington and Concord or something. I say he wasn't there. He wasn't he hadn't even like joined. I know they're fun, but you just can't do it. You know, you have to stick to the source. Um, he also, you know, won as many as he lost. Funny, I think generaling was maybe not his strongest here, but I do think that he, I mean, he was, you know, but but not quite as much as we, we build him up to be. Um, but he, I do not think gets enough credit for um, how smart he was during the revolution. And this is, this is his, he was sort of intellectual in action, you know, whereas he might not have studied at Harvard or gone to classes, even, you know, even in, at 17, 18, certainly not college, but he, he was a student of the world. Um, and he was, he, he was sort of innately good at these things. So one of the things he realized was there were two wars happening. There was a battle on the battlefield, and then there was a battle internationally, public opinion. Mm. So on the ground, the revolution was not, you know, every American, yes, you know, screw the British, ha you know, there were loyalists and loyalists were not happy about this situation. So Washington knew he had to win them over by making sure they knew every single British atrocity that happened. So he was very good at sort of circulating those things and made it be known that he wanted them to, to, to come out. Um, he also made sure um, that uh, he made this big show of wanting to follow the rules of war you know, there are acceptable periods in which you can keep a prisoner, such and so forth. And the British said, no, we don't have to because um, this isn't a revolution. This is a rebellion that we're quelling. And they kept saying that years and years and years into it. Um, and they, you know, hired Hessians, which are basically, you know, mercenaries and things got pretty ugly. And every time they did, he made a great show of it. So he, he won public opinion on the ground and through the world. And then the other thing that I think was really smart is they were out as, as, as Hamilton, you know, outmanned, outgunned. How did they do it? Intelligence. Washington knew intelligence was key and he loved being a spy master. And that's the funny thing about he cannot tell the, a lie. It's like, every, you can't be a good spy if you can't lie. You have to lie. It's not a bad thing. How, he, you know, you have to lie in those in those positions. Um, it is true. I, it, you know, it, it, I think Washington understood, if nothing else, the one important thing about being a revolutionary, which was uh, as long as the army exists, then the revolution exists. Um, yes. whether, or not you, whether or not you went on Tuesday doesn't matter. Yeah. So let me, we got incredible questions coming in and, and I want to jump to a, a couple of them and combine them again. Um, but let me start with this one. Um, Patsy Rowe points out that Washington, you know, certainly had the opportunity to think about a third term. Mm -hmm. um, but how do you, broad question, no wrong answer, obviously. How do you think American history would have turned out differently if he had taken that third term? Or I'll add on to it, if he had left after the first term. If he had left out after the first term, I think, um, I'm not quite sure. You know, the French Revolution was going on and they were, they were trying to create trouble here. Um, and he really didn't think that we could be fighting wars when we were just trying to be a new country, which takes, you know, all your resources and pay back debts. Um, and then you had Francophile. I think probably Jefferson and, 
and the Francophiles would have taken over and who knows where we would be because we would have then been really vulnerable. Um, the British would have definitely tried to take us back. Washington, if he had gone for a third term, I think it would have been really bad by his logic. So Washington not only just wanted to get out of Dodge, he just was done. He, he was very sensitive. Jefferson said he had never seen anyone so sensitive to criticism. And I think, you know, he was used to being a general and a slave master and a man in early America, which, you know, you don't get questioned a whole lot. You don't get criticized. And here he was from every corner and um, people who had been friends and who had praised him. So they were attacking him. Washington very clearly said that he did not want to die in office because if he did, we would assume because he was setting all these precedents, right? Two terms that didn't have to be made into a law until FDR. So these, these things, you know, Washington really did put in a lot of thought to them, good things and bad things. He gave them equal thought and, and you know, carried them out. If he had died in office, he feared that people would assume that it was king-like and that one should serve as president their entire life. Washington died pretty shortly thereafter, just a couple of years. So it would have been really bad, really would have. Mm-hmm. I think so. Well, and especially since we've been discussing, and you and I talked about this this afternoon, actually, you know, that, that the, the question of new questions of Washington keep returning to us again and again. And certainly one of the ones we've been discussing of late is the very concept of a peaceful transfer of power. Uh, and that's certainly something that we have been discussing with Washington in mind, I, I think, of late. Yeah, I mean, and, and by the way, these are really good questions. This is quite a lot of fun. Um, I, I was saying when we talked on the phone earlier that he gave up power, peaceful transfer of power. This is just something that Washington scholars say, and we don't really talk that much about it because it's not, you know, it's an uneventful, you know, the lame duck period is usually like, I don't know if you feel this way, but it's usually like my summer vacation, you know, I plan on reading some novels, doing some like cleaning, reorganizing, did not happen. Um, I think that the peaceful transfer of power the reason we probably should talk about it more, and I wrote a piece about this for, um, for Town and Country, it's not just that it is some like empty performance. It's not just the pageant of the inauguration. It, it's not any of those things. It's fine if you don't want to go to the inauguration. Wash, uh, you know, Trump was the fifth president to skip out. What mattered is that the peaceful transfer of power, again, showed the world that we were stable, that we could be trusted with loans, that we were dependable for trade. It was this projection of stability that we didn't really totally have. Now compare our revolution to the many revolutions we set off in the world, including the French Revolution, right? We just, in theory, you know, ejected our monarch and we followed the rules of war. So we weren't hanging people left and right. Mm -hmm. We all know about the guillotines. The monarchs were killed. Um, 10 years after that, Napoleon installs himself. It's kind of a mess. So compared to them, um, you know, it comes down. Why did, why, why were we so stable? Why do we view ourselves as exceptional? Washington, you know, by doing this, it really put us on the right path. It set the tone for our democracy. Um, And without it, I have to tell you, it sort of feels like losing a parent or a grandparent, you know, the world feels um, destabilized in a way. You know, that's a great point about the significance of demonstrating stability. It strikes me that uh, among the thousand and one different things that I would like to recommend to the Constitution's authors that they put in, were able to build a time machine and go back. Um, in, one of them might be an explicit line saying, the last official duty of a president is to hand over power. Uh, you know, they assumed it, they implied it, um, and Washington demonstrated it. And, and it's, it's really more important than I think that, that we realize even at the time. 
Um, so time is unfortunately running short. So I'm going to ask you a, a long question and then a short question. Uh, in fact, I'll just ask you the long question, then we'll hit the short question. Um, our, uh, the World Affairs intern, uh, Farhan, has offered a, a brilliant question, wanting to know about the standards by which we understand history today. Obviously, it's a moving target. It's always been a moving target. But do you think that we should be evaluating people like Washington, who frankly, you know, had a lot of, of uh, less than desirable acts, as we would say in the 21st century, uh, how do we evaluate the good and the bad of a different time period from our own perspective in your, in your mind? Absolutely. I think that's a really interesting question and has, you know, of course, it's something that we've all talked quite a lot about in terms of monuments and school names and freeways and all sorts of things. Um, first of all, the founders fully expected us to judge them. They said so. And to improve upon them, to change things. The, one of the big reasons they rebelled is they, they, deemed the par, they deemed parliament, the monarchy, the whole thing corrupt because they had never changed. People had just gotten into these power struggles. You need to adapt to the world. So they fully expected that. Washington also was kind of his best and worst historian. He kept everything. He annotated a lot of things from his from his youth and the things that he decided to keep are, are it's not a good look you know it's like genocide um however what so when when we talk about washington there have been these extremes and i'm saying washington because he's my subject but i think we can apply this to all the founders um there have been these extremes in which on one end of the spectrum you have people saying, you know, you cannot criticize the founders. You cannot do this, you cannot do that. And then at the other end of the spectrum, you have people who say, I don't really, I, I actually tweeted something about Washington um, around the time of, uh, yeah, the, the, that Washington would be really disappointed in the Republican party. And I wrote a piece for the Washington Post about it. And someone responded to me, I, you know, I don't really care what Washington thinks he owns slaves. And I responded, yes, but you should care because we clearly don't under, understand our country and you don't have a country without George Washington. So it sounds like you actually really need to read this book. And I did and not in like a confrontational way. He was being really confrontational and sort of like we had this weird exchange. And then a week ago, this person comes into my feed again and said, okay, so I read it, so did my mom. <laughs> this is an adult and we loved it and you're right. And that is like the ultimate win for me. It's all I wanted. I wanted people who knew Washington, who had read every book to reconsider him in a different way. And then I wanted people who had no interest in him to, um, and who were in fact very angry at him to read a book about him. Mm -hmm. This is essential. It's not, it's not whether, um, I am not, I, I, you know, I'm not judging him. I'm looking at him. And I think that is the most important thing where we need to start from. We're not judging and we're not celebrating. We're looking. And I hope that that's something we can do. Well, I got to tell you, I, I think you've done as much as anyone that I've read in forever uh, to really humanize Washington, to put flesh and bones on him. And I know that Jim just popped up, which means I'm supposed to turn things over to him. But, you know, go I, ahead, Joe. Keep on. Jeff. I've known Jim long enough to know I can ask one more question. Uh, there was one more question, speaking of flesh and bones, that came in, which I would love to you to answer quickly, if you don't mind. <laughs> What's the deal with the teeth? Oh, uh, the teeth. OK, this is a great example. Why we, we, you can ask sort of a third grader now. I know I've asked my, my niece and my nephew, wooden teeth. It's something they're still taught. We're, we've all sort of been taught this. And the question is, okay, we all know that's, a, that's absolutely absurd. Anyone who has handled wood at any point in their life, known, it would be a terrible material for dentures. It would, it would, the second it got wet, which is what happens in your mouth. Also, we would have heard about it. The founders were gossipy. They said mean things about each other's appearances all the time. There's not a word about it. But that's where it stops. 
we aren't taught to engage with the founders. It's either celebrate or ignore. And if we were, if we, the next question is, okay, so what were they made of? And part of the reason I think we haven't been taught is at best he was a poacher. We're talking about walruses at worst. Um, you know, he, he had enslaved the teeth of enslaved people in his mouth, which was not particular to Washington. Well, to do people did this, but what is particular to Washington is he used to go through, um, at the very beginning, he would go through his dentist and we have advertisements for that. And then he realized, you know, I own hundreds of people. I'm just going to go to the source and he paid them under market value. And that's again, where he sort of burned himself. That's in his ledger. Um, and so that is why we need to talk about Washington. Of course, he didn't have wooden teeth, but we haven't been taught or allowed to think critically about him. And if we can, then we can start to have these really essential conversations. Well, and there's, and there's so much complexity in that dynamic, you know, that he doesn't actually have to pay his own slaves for their teeth. He chooses to pay them, I guess, to make himself feel better. But then, of course, as you say, he doesn't pay market rate. So right. uh, he wants a deal at the same time. So I'll leave everybody to ponder that one when they go to sleep tonight and turn it over to Jim. Uh, well, we could tell that you all had great fun and I certainly had, and I'm sure our viewers did too, listening to you all. Uh, Alexa, I just subscribed to your podcast. So when I have my walk in frigid Dallas tomorrow, I'll be listening to it. Thanks so much for writing the book. Jeff, thank you for, as always, being just a, a wonderful conductor and not that it was needed at all tonight. And I uh, want to remind... Uh, everybody to go to our website at DFW World to keep up with our programs. And you can also go to the website for uh, the Center for Presidential History. I think that is smu.edu forward slash CPH. Is that right, Jeff? That's, that's correct. All righty. Everybody stay safe. If you're in uh, Dallas, Fort Worth, stay warm and we'll see you very, very soon. Thanks again for watching. Good night, everyone. Oh,